So I've spent $200 on Claude code, and the question is, is it actually worth it? And the answer is likely not for most of you. It's usually overkill for most casual coders, which is 90% of people watching this video. But I did uncover some insights that are definitely useful for people on the cheaper plans, such as the $20, $100 plan. So if you're considering cloud code, I'll share the breakdown of the exact mistakes I've made in the last 30 days so you can avoid those expensive mistakes. With that being said, let's dive in. So I created a cool little website we can walk through that takes you through the visual journey of the insights that I learned from this experience. So the first one is what I've stated previously. So the question here is, is this relevant for most people when it comes to cloud code Max Pro, which is the $200 plan? And the answer to this, as I've stated previously, is no. Reason being is that if you're not spending at least, I'd say, four to probably five hours of actively coding every single day, the usage limits are unnecessary and you can get a lot of what you need done with either the $20 plan or the $100 plan. Most people would be suitable just to use the $20 plan. Some people may wanna use the $100 plan, but I'd recommend starting with 20, see if that does what it needs for you and then only going up to 100 if necessary. All right, so the next one is the model that you're gonna use for coding. So oftentimes, if you have access to Opus, you obviously wanna say, okay, I wanna use the biggest and strongest model. So Opus 4 is the biggest and strongest model they have off to offer today. But from my experience, I found that Sonnet 4 actually consistently outperforms Opus when it comes to following instructions and coding one-shot prompts and building things without too many errors. So my first tip here is to go directly into your terminal and use the slash command slash model to then select Sonnet 4 as the model that you're going to use instead of Opus. Reason being is like I said, if you're preparing correctly and you have hyper-specific instructions with detailed prompts, from my experience, Sonnet 4 is by far way better. And as an interesting proxy, I built this website with the same exact prompt to Opus 4 and Sonnet 4. Sonnet 4 by far did a way better job at the aesthetics, animation, and everything else. So our next insight here is using clear over compact. So what does this mean? Well, first off, we should probably state what a slash command is. So a slash command is like a slash before some sort of word. So in this case, it could be clear. So this is a simple command we can give off to the AI to do for us. And when it comes to vibe coding or doing anything with AI that has long context, you want to consistently clear the context window so the AI performs at its best. Reason being is that we, we have an X axis here, so X and Y. So X or Y is going to be intelligence, so this would be I, and this will be context window for C. So the longer the context window, the more the intelligence degrades. So you want to always keep your context window as short as possible so you can get the most out of your AI when you're using it. To do this, you wanna clear the context window consistently. And there's two different ways you can do this inside of the tool. You can do clear and compact. So the reason I don't use compact and I recommend you use clear instead is you have no idea what's being compacted because compact in itself is something that's baked into cloud code where you're gonna take your conversation, and this is a conversation, representation of a conversation, and you're gonna run through um, slash compact. Once you've run it through this, compact's gonna distill that conversation down into something much smaller that you would then put into your next conversation that's going to be empty. And then the only part that you add is the compacted section that's been compacted and then you start coding. So you've cleared the conversation to a certain extent, but the issue is, is we have no idea what's inside of this. And I'd recommend doing clear, completely wiping it, and then starting completely fresh over and doing this as much as possible. That's the trick, is finding points when you need to clear and then clearing it when you can. And you might be like, yo, Dylan, I wanna use something like compact. Don't, don't give me that crap. So I'm like, all right, fine. You could do this ad hoc, and that's what I do sometimes. So if you do need to summarize the previous conversation because maybe you've hit a point where the context window is bloated and the AI is starting to perform horribly, what I'll do in this case is I'll ask the AI to summarize specific things that I know that are relevant for the next AI engineer that picked up where they've dropped off. So that, for example, it could be maybe I'm running into a recurring error. And in this case, I'll say, hey, I want you to summarize the errors we've run into, our attempts to fix this that failed, and do this in an unbiased way so you give enough detail for the next AI engineer to pick up where you've dropped off and effectively fix the bug. By doing this, we know exactly what's going to be in the summary because both we've given instructions and also we can see what's being compacted. We can copy and paste that into a fresh conversation after we've won, run slash clear, and then we're off to the races. Alrighty, so quick pause in your regular programming. This video is brought to you by yours truly. So below is a free link to a 30-day AI insight series. Well, you get 30 days of 30 insights in your inbox of how you can apply AI to your business and your work. If that's at all interesting to you, you should check out the link. And with that being said, let's keep going. All right, so after this one, we then have checkpointing. So this is one of the biggest issues and gripes that I have with Claude Code is that Cursor, Windsurf, all of these have native checkpoints. What does this mean? 
you can go back in time if the AI messes up. And this is something you'll have to do not too often, at least not these days, but in the past you had to, but you'll still have to do it frequently. And with Claude Code, what you'll have to do is you'll have to use Git. And the reason I have a gripe against this is this isn't necessarily something that's super welcoming to a lot of people that aren't technical. But luckily, it's not too complicated. All right, so let's write this process down that I follow. So first we have B for build, we'll do T for test, and then uh, I guess V for you validating it. So first the AI needs to build the feature that you care about. So this needs to be a micro feature, something that's small enough for the AI to build in a one shot, ideally one shot or in one iteration or one conversation. Once it's built a feature, it's gone off and tested the feature to ensure that it works. You've manually validated that the feature looks like it does. Once you've gone through this process, which will iterate on a consistent basis, then you'll go to this process of checkpointing it because you know this is validated, you know it's tested, you know it's built. So at this point in time, the application is in the state that you're happy with. So if so, you're gonna to go to a different terminal and run these three commands. You're gonna do git add dot, so it's gonna basically push or commit everything that's inside the repo that's been changed. You're then gonna do git get a little bit. <laughs> then you're gonna do git commit, and you're gonna do dash m for message, and then inside of this is gonna be basically the message you're gonna push. So it could be you know updated whatever, changed whatever, et cetera, et cetera. You write this in text. Once you've done that, then you'll do a git push that pushes this up to the remote repository in GitHub. This is the process you'll run every single time that you wanna create a checkpoint. The reason being is that eventually, your AI is gonna go off the rails. And when it goes off the rails, you wanna be able to revert back to this checkpoint here so you're not screwed where the AI messed everything up here. So when it, you, when it does messes everything up, what you'll have to do is give the AI the repository it's connected to this, say, hey, here's the URL to the repository. I want you to replace everything that you've done here back to this checkpoint that I care about. And you can give the URL to it, it'll refresh the local repo with the remote repo, and you'll be, you'll be good to go. I know it's convoluted, it's not as great as just pushing restore on cursor, but that's the way that Claude code currently works, I'm sure they'll fix that in the future, but that's just the way you need to create checkpoints consistently and why it's important to do so. All right, next is going to be subagents. So this is the new hot thing, everybody's talking about it, like, oh my god, subagents are the coolest thing, it's going to change the world. Um, I personally think they're useful, but only to a certain extent, and I don't use them as much as I think other people do. And there's a few reasons. One is I think running multiple sub agents and all these little lines you can you can see as sub agents, so be like little little sub agents that were spawning. Running all these at the same time is overkill. Reason being is we humans, say so this is our human here, that they can only have so much context in their head. And if we do run too many sub agents at once, it's going to get too convoluted for them to understand what's going on. That's one issue. Another one is oftentimes with this human, they're often working on one application at a time. So in this application they're working on, most applications, the code is somewhat connected. So if I have these little nodes here, and all these little nodes are connected, right? So this is my way of connecting the nodes, which is pretty bad. And then say you have your AI that's in here and they're doing some coding and they're changing something in this node. Well, when they change something here, it's automatically going to impact the other pieces. So if we try to have multiple sub agents changing multiple nodes at the same time, they're all going to conflict with each other. And this is exactly why the company cognition that's behind the tool Devon recommends using a single threaded agent instead of a parallel agent to do um, coding in any sense. So these are two big reasons as to why I wouldn't recommend using it, but I do still use them. And I use them in some use cases and down here are some useful uh, examples. So one is a UI agent. So this agent's just really good at building UIs, specifically using this library. And there's another one that's good at debugging and solving errors. In these cases, the reason I would use these subagents is they have a few different benefits. One is they're very specialized at a very specific task because I've given them a system prompt to be, to be that specific. In addition to that is their context window is completely fresh. So they have a fresh 200,000 token context window that's separated from the main line. So if this is the main branch that we're working on or the, actually the main context window that we're working in, and then when we create a subagent, it's going to create a separate context window that's completely fresh and starting from scratch, meaning that the AI that does the debugging here for the error is going to have a much better chance of solving the debug and not being diluted or confused by all the context previously. Once it's solved it, it'll then merge back into the main branch or the main context window when we're all kind of back in, in the same thread without having to blow anything with all the additional work that's been done here. The moral of the story, is to use them, use them sparingly in only very specific use cases and a one-off situation instead of running multiple sub-agents at once. And that's at least for now, until we have other agents that can verify and do all the other things, but it's a bit too complex for one human to handle. And I found that you actually move slower when you're running parallel agents, because I've tried this. I've ran many parallel agents and they've all ran for like an hour, two hours each. 
and it wasn't as effective as doing a single threaded uh, work with a single agent and or one additional agent to that. Alrighty, and then next is keeping cursor. So I recommend if you're going to get Cloud Code, I'd recommend still keeping and using cursor. And the main reason I still keep and use cursor is that it has access to O3 and or additional models that are not Cloud. So Cloud Code obviously only uses Cloud models today. And I know you can swap in different models into Cloud Code if you want but it's not getting all the additional features that you can get with cursor when it comes to linting and, and mapping your code base effectively and all those things. So I'd recommend keeping it if you can with a $20 plan. Reason being is I found consistently time and time again, where Claude would consistently try to fix a bug or an error, and it wouldn't be able to fix it. And I'd create multiple conversations, I keep trying over and over with different variations in the model, different prompts, etc. It just keeps failing. But then I would pass the same exact problem over to O3 inside of cursor, and it would fix it the first time. So there's definitely a, a huge deviation between the quality of the models for different types of problems they're solving. It's not saying one's better than the other, but when you fall short with one model, no matter how powerful it is, I recommend defaulting back to another state-of-the-art model such as O3 or Gemini 2.5 Pro, and having cursor allows you to have access easily to all those models on the $20 plan. All right, and then the next one here is Claude.md. So what is this? This is basically a rules file. So a rules file means that the AI is going to look at this file before it does anything. So you can give it specific instructions of saying, I want you to do X, Y, and Z before you do anything else or follow this type of writing of code, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's different ways you can guide the AI here with these. And Claude Code has a built-in way of creating this initially when you get into a project that I wouldn't recommend using. So it's slash init. So slash init, what's gonna happen with this command is it's going to go through your entire code base. It's gonna crawl the entire code base. And when it crawls the code base, it's going to summarize the overall project, the architecture, et cetera and then put that all into a new fresh Claude MD. So the AI has a good idea of what the project structure is. Reason being, I, the reason I don't use this, there's many reasons. One is it's overbloated and it's way too much uh, context to put at the beginning and could be distracting to the AI. Also, the project structure and overall um, code base is constantly changing. So that means that this needs to be constantly updated, which is kind of not useful. But more importantly, the main reason I don't add anything into this is my approach to doing Claude.md is retroactive. Meaning that when I run into an error and the AI continuously gets an issue, I'll then add that issue back into Claude.md once we've solved it. So say that we're trying to solve an error and we keep on failing. And these are each one of these lines or iterations. Finally, this one here, we hit a success and we solve the issue. I'm going to ask the AI to summarize exactly what the issue was we were running into, why we kept on running into the issue. And then for future reference to your future self, add instructions into the cloud.md that gives you future guidance so we can avoid this issue again. Here's some practical examples I wanted to share. So one here is giving it access to the back end. So I'm using Supabase for storing data. And if I want to store data and have the AI get access to Supabase, specifically the remote version of this and not in Docker because it likes to use Docker when it does this, is I will give it the creds. I'll give it the creds it needs access to Supabase. And I'd say store these securely and then make a note in the cloud.md file so you know exactly where to get the creds, how to get access to Supabase based off of your understanding of how to use the um, command line tools for Supabase. So in future iterations, when you need to check Supabase and or make migrations inside of it, you'll automatically default to understanding this context and you won't have to go through all the errors we ran into in the past. Another really good example is having the AI utilize a browser to do end-to-end -end tests for you, meaning it's gonna go around on the screen and click a bunch of buttons and do what it needs to do for you so you don't necessarily have to do that yourself. In this case, if I'm building an application that has authentication, so you have to log in, I will give it my credentials. I'll give it the username and password, have it store that securely, and then make sure it understands it needs to use the Playwright MCP to do this, and then take all those understanding and those learnings and shove that back into the cloud.md file so it references that in the future and doesn't run into a bunch of errors and, and struggle to run these end-to-end -end tests when it should be easy for it to do. So those are just two clear examples of how this has been useful for me of running this retroactive approach to adding information to cloud.md. All right, last and certainly not least, probably one of the most important ones, prep still matters. What do I mean by this? Well, I've talked about this a ton in previous videos, and there's a video down here I'll share with you in a second. But when you prepare to build a project with AI, I would say 70% of your time is dedicated just to the preparation phase. 30% is dedicated to the execution and having AI build the thing in the first place. Because the more effort you put into your prep, the easier it's going to be to do the coding. It's like the whole analogy from, I don't know, some old, I think it was like Abraham Lincoln or some sort of president at some time. He said they would sharpen an ax for three hours. So if they had four hours to cut down a tree, they had three hours, they would be sharp. They would sharpen the ax and the one hour they chopped down the tree, something like that. That's the same premise here. And the way that we're sharpening our ax and preparing 
is creating these three documents. So let me actually go down so you can see this. So these three documents here are the documents that I'll talk through in this video here. So I'd recommend checking that video out if you want more detail on how to do the preparation process. We're really going to create a specification document that's going to contain the what. So what are we building in detail? And the way you're going to do this is through a reverse AI interview, where an AI interviews you, asking you one question at a time with every answer you provide it, informing the next question it asks. And that then makes explicit what's in your head, pulls it out, and makes it concrete in a specification document. Next, we're going to convert this spec into a blueprint, which is going to cover the how. So how are we actually going to build what we're interested in building? Finally, we're going to convert this blueprint into a to-do list, which is going to act like a roadmap. So our AI then can reference the to-do list, check off the boxes as it goes and build each feature so it knows exactly where it sits in the macro stages of building this overall application. If you enjoyed this and you're interested in learning more about that, check that video out and it should be around here somewhere. And if you want to share the love, you can share this video with your friends. And also, like I said previously, below is a link to a free 30-day AI Insights series where you'll get 30 days of AI insights of how you can apply AI to your work and your business. And if that's at all interesting to you, you should check out the link. And while you're down in the description, if you're at all interested in working with me, there's a link down there for that as well. So with that being said, internet, I'll see you next time.